أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب القلوب وشافع أنفسنا عبد القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله على دائم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon Fatima and her father and her husband and her children. Dear viewers, brothers and sisters in Islam and indeed any viewers who may be tuning in from a non-Muslim background, I welcome you back to this episode of this program right here on the Imam Hussein channel from the laws of Zahra alayhi salam. For those of you who have been tuning in before, you would know, of course, this program is a program which is set to discuss some of the laws which can be derived from these statements and narrations of Sayyidah Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. When we say laws, we don't only mean fiqhi masail pertaining to ibadat and mu'amalats or pertaining to worship and daily transactions. Rather, we mean even some of the finer details of etiquette, aqidah, namely creed and belief, and some other matters which are important to the affairs of the Muslims and also to the non-Muslims. When we first began discussing the necessity of having such a work being produced and discussed openly within the English language, particularly for a non-Muslim viewing audience, we made it clear that there are certain things which require these matters to be made clear by the Muslims. Namely, we find ourselves living in a time in which every Joe Bloggs, every Tom, Richard and Harry finds himself speaking about the religion of Islam and claiming to be an authority on the religion of Islam. And we made clear that there is a real problem of authority. Who's qualified to speak? in the name of the religion of Islam and whose Islam is the true Islam for we find that some people they may have a distorted form of Islam and they may even have proofs from their own distorted textual sources which according to other Muslims have no authority whatsoever to be speaking in the name of Islam so we find that there is this eternal dilemma which is the problem of interpretation the problem of authority in the previous episode, we began to introduce the personality of Sayyidah Fatima Zahra and how she herself is part and parcel of what I called in one of the previous episodes the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's self-preservation mechanism to preserve the religion of Islam from external and even internal. When we say internal, we mean from those who were claiming to be Muslims, infiltration, manipulation, distortion, and perversion. In the previous episode, we began to introduce some of the highlighted qualities of Sayyidah Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. I've made clear already, this is not a show about the biography of Sayyidah Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. I'm not here to give you biographical details in regards to this great woman. I'm here to merely speak about some of the clear cuts merits, fadail, khasais, and clear-cut exhortations of Sayyidah Fatima Zahra, Zahra which make her distinct from all other women, which make her a unique character and role model within the religion of Islam. I feel this is particularly pertinent, not only because it allows us to understand the nature of the religion of Islam, leading up to the events today in which we see groups like ISIS or ISIL as they occasionally call themselves speaking in the name of Islam but more importantly because it allows us to understand where did things go wrong when did we start having terrorists in the name of Islam speaking in the name of Islam and trying to oppress others if it can be successfully demonstrated that the thesis of Sayyid Muhammad al husseini al-Shirazi, the author of a work from the laws of Zahra alayhi salam, who we have already spoken about in great detail, 
is true. Namely, that Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam is the archetypal, historical manifestation of true Islam in its essence, and that she was combating a distortion, an alien perversion speaking in the name of Islam, then indeed we can demonstrate that the problem of authority begins here. That we have those designated by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa in order to speak about Islam and we have those who worked against them in order to undermine them. We began yesterday by looking at one of the clear-cut qualities of Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra agreed upon between two or all sects of Islam, so to speak, who agree upon narrations. Of course, you have some modern-day sects which reject narrations altogether, but allow us to recount what we said. We said that it is found within the collections of both the followers of Ali Muhammad, namely the Shia, and the collections of the Sunnah, of the Sunnis rather, but the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa had said, Fatima is a part of me, whoever angers her has angered me. And we looked at some of the conclusions which can be derived from such a statement. We made it clear that unless someone is going to accuse Allah Azza wa Jal of failure, and accuse the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa of blemish, then indeed such a narration stands as a clear-cut one proving and establishing with beyond any reasonable shadow of doubt that Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra is infallible. How did we reach this conclusion logically and from the text itself? We reached this conclusion by saying that if the Holy Prophet had wanted to make this statement muqayyid, if he had wanted to make it a conditional statement, as the scholars of Iml al-Usul would say, then indeed he would have said, Fatima al-Zahra is a part of me, whoever angers her in affair X, or whoever angers her without correct justification, or whoever angers her, and he would have added the conditions or specifics in order to reduce his statements to a meaningful one. Because he left the statement open, the statement becomes a mutlak one. It becomes a non-conditional statement. It becomes a statement which is binding in all circumstances. The anger of Fatima al Zahra is the anger of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Now, the brothers and sisters of both the Shia, the followers of the Ahl al-Bayt and indeed people who maybe come from other schools who are used to these kind of discussions, maybe even truth seekers from the other schools. And inshallah ta'ala we ask Allah Azza to make us all truth seekers, to make us all those who are searching for the truth. And we pray that Allah Azza would guide us all to whatever the reality is of the matter. Might be familiar with where I'm heading here. Now, I'm, I'm not going to head directly there, but I am introducing this particular quality of Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra for a reason. For indeed, it can be established beyond any reasonable shadow of doubt that there was a party who offended her, who upset her, who angered her, who caused her grief. And indeed, if the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's statement is true, then who are you to make it conditional? just because you love such figures. Indeed, I understand I'm rubbing a sore bruise here. And indeed, I do not intend to offend anyone. I do not intend to cause anyone grief because they have certain preconceptions, they have certain beliefs which I may be offending here. It is not my intention. By Allah, I, I'm a person who has learned and come to hate polemics. For I'm someone who, due to the social circles I have, constantly have friends who wish to rob the sultan and gratuitously insult my own beliefs. That's not what I'm here to do tonight. None of us, inshallah ta'ala, should be taking away from this show that the aim is to insult others or to bring up sensitive topics when it's unnecessary to do so. Inshallah ta'ala, we're only speaking about these issues because we wish to arrive at the truth. And the truth of the matter is, Fatima Zahra is an infallible 
recourse which the Holy Prophet left us in order to understand what the truth of a religion of Islam is. In order for me to elaborate, to further elucidate upon the qualities of Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra, allow me to quote from the narrations of those who do not come from the school of the Ahlul Bayt and particularly from individuals who were hostile to the Ahlul Bayt in order to see what qualifications they have given the Ahlul Bayt themselves and in particular Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra. It is narrated in the book Al Mustadraq Al Sahihain of Al Hakim Al Naysaburi, one of the ulama of the Ahl Sunnah, that Zakaria bin Zahid narrates from Firas, who narrates from Al Shu'bi, who narrates from Al Masruq, who narrates from Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, that she stated the Prophet said in his illness, in which he died, namely the state in which he died. Now, there's a discussion as to whether or not he was legitimately ill in the sense that we are ill, but this is unimportant. We're not submitting to the content of this narration aside from the merit of Fatima, which can be extracted from it. O Fatima, namely this is the Prophet addressing Fatima. O Fatima, are you not pleased with the fact that you are the mistress of the ladies of all the worlds and the mistress of the ladies of this Ummah, and the mistress of the ladies of all believers. al Hakim states that this narration is authentic, and the Vahabi, who is one of the critical commentators on al Hakim's gradings, someone respected highly in the Sunni world, affirms it. Aisha also narrates that Fatima came walking and her her, her stance or the way she carried herself resembled the manner in which the Holy Prophet also carried himself. The Prophet said, Welcome, O my daughter. Then he made her sit on his right or on his left side, and then he told her a secret, and she started to weep. I asked her, Why are you weeping? He again told her a secret and she started to laugh. I said, namely Aisha states, I never saw happiness so near to sadness as I saw on that day. She thereafter states, I asked her what the Holy Prophet ﷺ had told her and she responded, I would never disclose the secrets of Rasulullah. Bear this in mind for our discussion later on. But Fatima Zahra salam, it is not in, within her nature to disclose the secrets of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Then when the Holy Prophet passed away, Aisha went on to ask Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra, what was it that caused you to laugh and cry as you did on those times? She said that when the Holy Prophet first whispered to me, he announced his martyrdom. He announced that he would be passing away to the abode of his Lord. And so I weeped with the grief of such news. And the second time he whispered to me, he announced that I would be the first of his ummah to join him. And he asked me, are you not pleased to be the mistress of the ladies of paradise and the mistress of all believers? Now this is a narration from someone hostile to Allah Muhammad. And inshallah ta'ala, now we have to venture off for a short break. I pray that you will all join me after the short break. Wassalamu alaikum. Grand Ayatollah Muhammad Shirazi was the religious authority merge to millions of Shia Muslim around the globe. A charismatic leader who is known for his high moral values, modesty and spirituality. He is a mentor and source of aspiration to the millions and the means of access to authentic knowledge and teachings of Islam. He has made extensive contributions in fields of learning ranging from jurisprudence and theology to politics, economics, law and sociology. Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi was born in the holy city of Najaf, Iraq in 1374 after Hijra, 1927 AD. He belongs to a distinguished family deeply rooted in Islamic science, literature and virtue. His followers are found in many countries in the global, 
Grand Ayatollah Shirazi was distinguished for his intellectual ability and holistic vision. He was recognized for his clear ideas and realistic solutions to issues of concern to mankind. He has written various specialized studies that are concerned to be among the most important references in the Islamic sciences of beliefs and doctrine, ethics, politics, economics, sociology, law, human rights, etc. He has enriched the world with his staggering contributions of some 1300 books, treaties, and studies on various branches of learning. His works range from simple introductory books for the young generations to literary and scientific masterpieces. Deeply rooted in the Holy Quran and the teachings of the Prophet of Islam, his visions and theories covers areas as politics, economics, government, management, sociology, theology, philosophy, history, and Islamic law. His work on Islamic jurisprudence, for example, contributes 150 volumes which run into more than 55,000 pages. Through his original thoughts and ideas, he has championed the causes of issues such as the family, human rights, freedom of expression, political pluralism, non-violence, and shura or consultative system of leadership. Grand Ayatollah Shirazi believes in the fundamental and elementary nature of freedom in mankind. He calls for freedom of expressions, political plurality, debate and discussion, tolerance and forgiveness. He strongly believes in the consultative system of leadership and calls for the establishment of the leadership council of religious authorities. He calls for the establishment of the universal Islamic government to encompass all the Muslim countries. Dear viewers, welcome back to the show. Before the break, you will remember we were discussing the merits of the state of Fatima to Zahra salam, mentioned according to the words of people who were generally accepted by history to be opponents of the family of the Holy Prophet Now, non-Muslim viewers, even viewers who are not from the school of the Ahl al-Bayt the who are not from the Shia, may be confused as to how I might refer to someone who is a wife of the Holy Prophet as an opponent of the family of the Prophet. For indeed, according to Western terminology, we definitely accept that the wife of someone is from their family. When I state this, of course, I don't want to enter into this discussion with great depth, but just to allude to my rhetoric here, we believe that the Quran has delineated clearly that someone's family is particularly when it comes to a prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and upon indeed the other prophets it is referring to specifically a spiritual quality it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with blood relation so we find in the quran that the son of Noah, or the son of noah the biblical prophet who we find mentioned in the quran is chastised and is referred to as not being from the family of noah or Noah alayhi salam because of his unrighteous actions. Likewise, we say the same thing about the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi, that his family have a certain spiritual recognition and they are those who are spiritually close to him, his Ahlul Bayt, his infallible Ahlul Bayt. Moving back to the narrations in which we quoted from the opponents of the Ahlul Bayt, we mention one in which Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi, had mentioned the status of Fatima. We find her alluding to this again in Sahih al-Bukhari itself, in which she narrates, Fatima, salam Allah alayha, came walking, and her, again, her walk and her demeanor resembled the demeanor of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi said, welcome, O my daughter. Then he made her sit on his right or his left side, and then he told her a secret and she started weeping. I asked her, why are you weeping? He again told her a secret and she started laughing. I said, never have I seen happiness so near to sadness as I saw on that day. I asked her what the messenger had told her. She said, I would never disclose the secrets of Allah's apostle When the Prophet died, I asked her about it again. And she replied, the Holy Prophet said, every year Jibra'il salam, the angel Gabriel, used to revise the Quran with me once only. But this year he has done so twice. 
I think this portends towards my death and you will be the first of my family to join me. So I started weeping. Then he said, don't you like to be the mistress of all the ladies of paradise or the mistress of all the lady believers? So I laughed for that. Likewise, we find that not only have the opponents of Ali Muhammad, which is a great honor to the status of Ali Muhammad, have narrated such things, we find that their allies, those who did wali of them, have likewise narrated such things. We find that Hudayfa narrates in the following narration, narrated Hussein ibn Muhammad from Israel, from Maysar ibn Habib, from Manhal ibn Amr, from Zer ibn Huayish, from Hovayfa, who said, My mother asked me, how long is it since you met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? I said, since such and such a period of time. So she got angry and abused me. I said to her, let me go to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and pray the Maghrib prayer with him. And then I will not leave him until he asks forgiveness for you and me. So I went to the Prophet and prayed toward and prayed the Maghrib with him. Then the Prophet kept praying until Isha. Then I stood up and walked towards him. Then someone came to him and talked to him and then went. So I kept walking towards him. Then he heard my voice and said, Who is that? I said, Hovayfa. He said, What do you want? So I told him the story. Then he said, May Allah forgive you and your mother. Because Hovayfa, of course, asked him for asked the Holy Prophet for forgiveness and said, did you see that one who talked to me a moment ago? I said, yes, for as Hubayfa said, I saw the Prophet was busy. He said, namely the Prophet said, he was an angel who had never come down to earth before this night. He had asked Allah to let him come down to me and salute me and give me the glad tidings that Allah, that Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam, and that Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam are the masters of the youth in paradise, and that Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam is the chief of the ladies of paradise. So we find that these narrations, such as this one found in Musnad Ahmed bin Hanbal and graded as authentic by the Muhakkakin delineate just how great a status Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra had in the eyes of the companions and indeed the other Ahl al-Bayt had in the eyes of the companions. We'll come back to a brief snippet mentioned in that narration later on when we look at how the enemies of Islam have distorted these narrations. It is narrated by Nasai, as is mentioned by Ibn Hajr al Askilani in his work Fath al Bari fi Sharh Sahih al Bukhari. It is narrated by An Nasai through an authentic chain from Abdullah ibn Abbas, Rahmatullah alayhi wa radiyallahu an, who said that the greatest of all women of paradise are Sayyidah Khadija, Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra, Sayyidah Maryam, and Sayyidah Asiya. Of course, Asiya being the wife of Fir'aun who is praised in the Qur'an. This is also narrated through a Tirmavi from an authentic chain. And that an angel of, came to the Messenger of Allah وآله, and gave him the good news that Sayyidah Fatima Zahra is the mistress of these ladies in paradise. So we find that in these narrations, the greatest of all the women according to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi are four. Who are these four women? And they are Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, her mother Sayyidah Khadija, Maryam, and Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. This is an agreed upon fact, and you can find this in the books of many scholars of both the Shia and the Sunnah, and this is particularly a narration found amongst the Sunnah. Fatima al-Zahra is not compared to other women in the rawayat of the Ahlul Bayt. But how did we find these narrations were tampered with? 
And I mentioned earlier on when we looked at that narration saying that Fatima al-Zahra was the chief of all women and Hassan and Hussein, Hassan and al Hussein are the chief of the youth of paradise that such narrations are often tampered with. How did they tamper with the fact that Hassan and Hussein were the chiefs of the youth of paradise? They came forward and narrated other narrations saying that companion X and companion Y are the chiefs of the middle-aged men of paradise. And this is ironic because we find that the Holy Prophet ﷺ has said that everyone in paradise will be youth. There will be no middle-aged people. So we find it strange that such narrations could be true. Likewise, we find that Bukhari, when he narrates this narration about the fawail of a woman of paradise, narrates the following one. The Messenger of Allah ﷺ said, Many men reach the level of perfection, but no woman reached such a level except Bibi Maryam or Sayyida Maryam السلام, the daughter of Imran and Sayyida Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun and the superiority of Aisha according to this Bukhari narration to other women is like the superiority of Farid over Marag. Now of course those of you who happen to come from an Iraqi background or an Arab background we know what Farid and Marag are Thurid, of course, is a dish in which you put pieces of bread and you soak it up with the, I guess we could say, marak or stew. But this narration makes absolutely no sense. Some people prefer marak over thurid. Some people don't like thurid even. I don't happen to like thurid. Now, I'm not sure if it's reactionary to this narration, but I'm not someone who normally likes thurid. So when we find these narrations, they praise... Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, they praise Maryam and then they neglect the mention of two individuals. Who are these two individuals? They neglect Sayyidah Fatima the Zahra and they neglect Sayyidah Khadija. Why is this done? This is done again to diminish the role of Ali Muhammad from the very essence of Islam. And unfortunately we find that this very same narration with this same chain of narration, this same Isnad when it is mentioned in Al-Tabari's tafsir, is mentioned without this insertion about Aisha and mentions both the names of Sayyidah Fatima Zahra salam, and her mother Sayyidah Khadija. So we find a tampering has gone on. Is this tampering something rare in the religion of Islam? Has this attempt to diminish Ahl al-Bayt been something proven to be confined to one or two narrations? Absolutely not. In fact, whole books have been written on this about how the merits of the Ahlul Bayt have been weakened, distorted, attributed to other people, and the merits attributed to other people are ones snatched from the Ahlul Bayt. The important point here is that we are discussing the status of Sayyidah Fatima to Zahra salam, and her role in the religion of Islam. It is unfortunate that things have been fabricated in which people have tried to diminish this status. I pray that you will continue to analyze the status of Sayyidah Fatima Zahra with me in the next show, for indeed the time has run out, dear viewers. And I thank you once more for joining me on this episode of From the Laws of Zahra salam. Please join me for the next episode in which we will be continuing with the merits of Sayyidah Fatima Zahra and more importantly proving the mavlumiya or the oppression of Sayyidah Fatima Zahra leading us into the introduction of the book from the laws of Zahra by the great author Sayyid Muhammad Al Husseini Al Shirazi. Thank you again for joining me on this show. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.